to hear your word, to understand it, to hear this word of truth and to be blessed by it. We ask that work of the Spirit through me, but in us all as we hear, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. One thing that stands out for me as you read um, any of Paul's letters really is that this is a, a man who is grateful. He's not a grumbler really in any form and certainly he had lots of situations perhaps where he could have grumbled. Every letter starts with praise and thanksgiving and this letter to the Colossians really is no different. This was a church like many others, a church that faced challenges within but also without the challenge of living as a Christian in a culture that wanted you to conform to its way of thinking. So just to give you a little bit of background, as with many of these churches, this is a church that exists in the ancient world, in the midst of the Roman Empire, a culture in which Caesar was to be your king, not Christ. So that's the external challenge, if you like, this church faced, along with many of the others in the New Testament. But there was also the challenge within, the challenge of false teaching infiltrating the church. And as we'll see as we go through these, this letter, this was a very real concern for Paul as he writes. Very real challenges for believers then, but also still for us today. But these are not challenges that crush Paul. Preaching the gospel clearly brought suffering into his life. Caring for believers brought heartache, disappointment, discouragement, criticism on occasions. Following Christ came at a cost. So why wasn't he overwhelmed? Why did he not become a grumbler? Why did he not become disheartened? Well, it's that one word, gratitude. I think he is grateful for three things as he begins this letter. He is grateful for, for God's king, he is grateful for God's people, and he is grateful for God's word. That's what we see in these opening verses. Gratitude to God. Paul has good spiritual sight, if you like. He sees God. He sees the blessings of the gospel. He sees God's purposes and plans for the church, and he rejoices in these things. So he praises God before he turns to the problems, and that's a common trend we see in his letters. He reminds us, as God's people today, that we have much to give thanks for. We have our own challenges, don't we? Within, without, in the culture in which we live, pressures that we live under, and yet he calls us to be a people of gratitude, of thanksgiving. That's a strong theme we'll see as we go through the letter, that we would be a, a thankful people. Verse 1 and 2 are words of greeting, but they are also words of thanksgiving. Initially and first of all, God, uh, Paul is grateful for God's king. He gives thanks for the grace and peace that are ours through Jesus Christ. Now, notice in these opening couple of verses, Paul says something about himself. He says something about the Colossians. But most importantly, he's pointing us to Christ. First, Paul tells us he is Christ's man, not Caesar's man. He is an apostle of Christ Jesus. Notice the word order there. I think that's quite significant. He says Christ Jesus, not Jesus Christ, which is what we find in some of the other letters. Now, Christ means anointed one. It's a way of saying God's king, God's chosen one. Paul puts, in other words, his position, his title first. And he does that for a reason, I think. Because one of the, the themes of this letter is that Christ is king. He is Lord over creation, Lord over the world, Lord over the church. And so Paul here is beginning the letter and reminding us of who's really in charge. Not Caesar, not the mighty Roman Empire of that day, not the politicians of our, our age, but Christ Jesus. And it's Jesus that he serves. He says he is an apostle of Christ. In other words, God's messenger, chosen by the will of God, we're told. Here's a reminder that he writes with authority to the Colossians then, but also to us today. Timothy is mentioned as well, an important co-worker. They did much together in mission. 
a brother in Christ, but not an apostle like, like Paul. They have a different calling, a, a complementary one, but a different calling. Paul is an envoy of King Jesus. He speaks with authority as an apostle. So he introduces himself. In doing so, he points us to Christ. And then he speaks of the Colossians. Look how he describes them. Verse 2, they are saints and faithful brothers in Christ. Now, Paul didn't plant this church. It's likely the fruit of his ministry uh, during his time in Ephesus. Um, uh, Colossae was about 80 miles to the east of Ephesus, so it's probably the fruit of his preaching there. In, in Acts 19, we're told that, that during the two years he spends in Ephesus, all of Asia hears the word of the Lord, and so that's the region around Ephesus. Verse 7 tells us that Epaphras was the man, or seems to be the man, sh who shares the gospel with them. He's significant in the life of this church. So it's more than likely Paul has never met these Christians. Yet he has concern for them. He calls them saints. They're faithful brothers. In other words, they're family. They're holy. They're forgiven. That's what it means when he calls them saints. He's reminding them what they are in Christ. So Paul is an apostle of Christ, but they are all saints and brothers in Christ. Jesus is the one, is the king who cleanses. He's the king who calls a people for his own. They are a new people united to Christ. That's what that phrase, in Christ, means. And we'll see it a number of times throughout the letter. We see it a number of times throughout the New Testament. It's a significant phrase. It speaks of our union in Jesus. When Paul says the Christian is in Christ, he's saying you are united with him in his death, his resurrection. You have died with him. You are raised with him. You will ascend with him to heaven. Now, this is, again, something Paul is going to expand on, particularly in, a, in Colossians 3. He's going to speak of the implications of this, how it should transform our way of living. Paul doesn't say here, does he, that they are becoming saints. He's saying this is a statement of fact, a declaration of what they are in Jesus. A new people, a saved people, a forgiven people, a cleansed people. He's pointing them and pointing us to what Christ has done for the Christian, of what the Christian has received. So notice here, even as, as Paul praises God, he's preaching to us. He's saying something to us through this, even these opening words of greeting. Right at the start, Paul wants them to see who they are. They are completing Christ. They are children of Christ the King. And he is a king whose rule is both gracious and brings peace. Don't skip over that, that final greeting. We get it often, don't we, in these letters in the New Testament. But it's significant. Paul is not wasting his words. The Romans brought a degree of peace to the ancient world, sort of harmony to various people, groups, and nations. That mighty empire brought stability and prosperity to many places. But it was a peace dependent on military might and conquest and conformity an economic peace, not peace with God. And that's the peace that really Paul is pointing us to here. A peace that is only available through the grace of God. What had made these believers brothers? What had made them saints? Well, it's the grace of God. Paul was an apostle of Christ. The Colossians were in Christ because of the grace and peace that comes from God through Christ. The king Paul serves is the servant king. Man pursues peace in every age, don't we? That is something deep down we're all searching for. Harmony, peace. People seek for it in many ways and in many places. But there's a, a, a reminder here that peace is only found by a gift of God. It's something God gives through Jesus Christ. We must experience the grace of God first if we are to experience the peace that follows. And God's grace is seen through Jesus. Jesus. 
And so Paul's greeting here is full of gratitude for God's king. He calls us to give thanks for the grace and peace that is ours through Christ. He's reminding you and I this evening of what we are if we are in Christ. Believers, you are a saint. You are a brother and sister in Christ. That's what we are collectively, how we are related to one another through Christ the King. We are God's people. We belong to his kingdom. And that's where Paul goes secondly in his thanksgiving. He's grateful for God's people. Grateful for God's king. Secondly, grateful for God's people. He gives thanks for the way in which the gospel has transformed these believers in Colossians. Verses 3 through to 5. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Do you rejoice in God's church? Because Paul certainly does. He thanks God for other believers. And he sees three things at Colossae that are marks of a a genuine Christian. If you're wondering, well, what, what are the marks of a genuine Christian? Paul gives us three things here. Faith, love, and hope. A triad that, again, we find regularly throughout the New Testament. He thanks God for their faith in Christ Jesus. Notice it's not faith alone that counts. It is the object of our faith. It is faith in Christ. They believe in Jesus. They've personally trusted and followed Christ. They don't just know about him. They don't just admire him. They have faith in him. They believe who he is, why he came. They have put their trust and hope in Jesus as Savior. Faith in the Bible is always something active, something life-changing. It's believing that Jesus alone is the one that we need to save us. Not faith in ourselves, our works, our achievements. Not faith in others, but faith and trust in Jesus alone. There is no Christian without faith in Christ. Now that that might sound very obvious to many of us this evening. Yet some are tempted to believe that they're Christians simply by going to church or, or going to a Christian school or growing up in a Christian home. A true Christian, we're being reminded, is one who has put their faith and trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. He is the one they follow. They confess Christ with their Lord, with their mouths, as their Lord with their mouths. But also their lives. Notice, this gospel has transformed these people, and that's what Paul is giving thanks for. Paul thanks God for the love that you have for all the saints. True faith is always seen. A love for God produces a love for his people. That is a a significant evidence that someone is truly born again. There is a desire to be with the people of God. That doesn't mean everything's always easy. But there there is a desire to be in community with other Christians. A Christian who has no concern for other Christians is unlikely a Christian. The Bible doesn't recognize individual faith that doesn't express itself in love for others. And the love that's spoken of here is sacrificial. It's the love of Christ. The one who laid down his life for us calls us to serve one another. Notice it's a love that doesn't discriminate. These Colossians don't just love some of the saints. Their love is wide and broad. Paul says, speaks of their love for all the saints. Now, quite what that means, whether it's all of the saints in Colossae or, or beyond, uh, around the sort of region and the world at that time, we're not sure. But Colossae alone was a, a, div- a, di- a diverse place. We get hints of this in, in chapter 3, verse 11, where Paul says there's neither Greek, Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. It's not a big place. But it was a diverse place, and this church would have reflected that. The gospel has united people from very different backgrounds. And so I think he's speaking here of that love that they have for all the saints, regardless of their background. That is not a kind of love we see easily in the world around us. 
It's a supernatural love born of the Holy Spirit. Word is reaching Paul of this love. Now, he's quite a long way away at this time. He's writing from prison in Rome. He hasn't visited, so that's a significant distance away in the ancient world. And yet, he's heard of their, their faith and their love. And it's a love he knows himself, isn't it? Because that's why he's writing. That's why he's concerned. That's why he's interested in them. He certainly has his own problems, constrained in many ways in his own ministry. And yet he's hungry for them to grow as believers. He takes time to write to them. He prays for them. So he sees their faith. He sees their love. It reflects his own. Thirdly, he thanks God for their hope. Why do they love in this way? He tells us why. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. They are living in light of what lies ahead. They know where they belong, the direction they're heading in. Christian hope, in other words, is more than wishful thinking. It's centered on a person and a place. It's rooted in the death and resurrection of Jesus. It looks ahead to the promise of heaven. We don't experience all the fruits of Jesus' death and resurrection now. We're awaiting the return of Christ. We're awaiting that hope of heaven. We are exiles away from home. These believers he rejoices in have a future focus. They're looking ahead. That stirs them. That helps them in the present. It's the cause uh, of their love. So here are three marks of a genuine Christian, faith in Christ, a Christ-like love for his people, and a future hope. God's people come from many different backgrounds, but they worship the same Lord, they belong to the same family, they share the same hope. Are you thankful for the church? I'm sure there are times where you think, I've had enough of this, maybe a difficult conversation or experience. We've, I'm sure we've all been there at points, maybe points where we're tempted to give up on the church, maybe be easier to go alone. Loving others isn't easy. Being in community with others who are different from us is hard at times. Churches aren't always happy places. Other Christians can disappoint us, hurt us, fail us. Perhaps you find yourself more tempted to grumble about the people of God. Well, let me encourage you to give thanks, as Paul does, for the church. He encourages us to see the church as God sees it. To remember that every church is a community of God's grace, the family of Christ, to see other believers as brothers and sisters in the Lord. We need to see God's purposes for the church, but also pray for the church. We need to practice gratitude. That's something in the New Testament we're often told to do, and it's, we're told, aren't we, because we find it hard at times. We're not naturally inclined to think of the positives necessarily. One thing we do in our family sometimes when the tensions are running high, we'll sit around the, the dinner table and we'll actively say, right, you, you are, we're going to pray for one another and we're going to give thanks for a, a, a trait or, or something positive about the person next to you, <laughs> whether that be your husband, wife, your brother, or your sister. Let's go around and practice some gratitude. And that's not always easy to do, but it's a good thing to do. It helps us to think, yeah, okay, maybe I, I need to reflect differently about uh, this person. And that's something I think helpful for us to do in a church. I'm not suggesting we suddenly make a big circle and do the same thing, but I think it's a good thing, isn't it, for us to, to be praying for one another and to be thanking God for one another, even those that we find more difficult at times. Lord, why have you brought that person into my life? Well, at the very least, they are a sanctified uh, uh, person in Christ Jesus, a brother or sister in the Lord. So it's good to practice thankfulness. Do you pray for fellow believers in this church? Do you give thanks for them? So Paul gives thanks for God's king, for God's people, finally God's word. That's the third thing, verses five to eight. Paul is grateful for what does God use to transform lives? What leads people to Christ? It's his powerful and active word. 
That's what the Lord's used to establish this church in this city. Verse 5 says, they heard the word of truth, the gospel. It's a word of truth because it's God's word. And it's a word that all need to hear. Paul says, it is bearing fruit. It's increasing in the whole world. Verse 6. I think he's saying to the Colossians here, you, you know, you're not alone. Th th this word is bearing fruit in other places. He gets to see some of that, doesn't he? He's a, a traveling evangelist, or was until he was imprisoned. He's been to many places. He's been involved in the planting of many churches. He says this is bearing fruit around the world. Be encouraged. The word of God is powerful and effective. He testifies to the transformative power of God's word. It's living and active. God's kingdom is growing as his word is proclaimed. A timely reminder, isn't it? Again, for us, an encouragement. The word of God must be central to the mission of the church. You know, we're not called to entertain people. Our mission is more than social justice or relieving poverty. Those are good things. Our job is to be a herald of the word of God. God speaks and God calls us to share what he's spoken, to point through his word to Jesus Christ. That's how the Colossian church was born. And God is continuing to use his word today. This is a forgotten book in many ways in our society, isn't it? The more searching question is, is it a, is it a forgotten book within the church? Especially when it comes to evangelism. Do we believe, do we have faith that God can work through his word as it is proclaimed? Because the word of truth reveals the God of grace. It points people to Christ. It is, has always been God's means of growing his kingdom. And notice how God raises up messengers with the message. That's who Epaphras was, verse 7. God's messenger to Colossae. Notice how he's described, verse 7. He's a beloved fellow servant, a faithful minister of Christ. A man we don't know as much about as we do Paul, but he's clearly God's instrument. He's an example for us. He's the man who has been involved significantly in the, the growth of this church. What does the Lord call us to be? Well, he calls us to be faithful, to proclaim his word, not our own, to trust in the power of his word, not our plans. We're to be faithful. God is the one who brings the fruit the harvest. Paul is wanting to give these believers confidence. He's saying to them, you've heard the complete gospel message. Now that's significant because later he's addressing situations that perhaps are seeking to undermine this, that they need something further, an additional experience or a, a new understanding. He's saying to them, you heard the complete gospel. Epaphras was a faithful man. You've heard the lot. You don't need anything more. You are complete in Christ, the gospel you heard. Paul has no reason to doubt that they're true Christians or that they heard the authentic gospel message. Paul sees the power of the word of God at work in their lives. They are the fruit. It's led them to Christ. It's making them more like Christ. Epaphras was not only a messenger to Colossae, he was the one who who knew Paul, he's brought him news, who's been that go-between, if you like. He's made known to Paul their love in the Spirit, verse 8. What a lovely expression. Their love in the Spirit. The seed of God has produced a harvest in their lives. And this is clearly a work of God. It's a supernatural love, born of his Spirit. Notice here that Paul doesn't glory in himself. He glories in the gospel. We've seen marks of a genuine believer in this passage, but there's also marks here of genuine ministry, genuine gospel ministry, because Paul always points people to Jesus. It's God he wants others to see, not himself. He's a servant of Christ. And that is what every gospel minister should be, whether they stand at the front here and preach or whether it's in conversation uh, with others about our faith. Our job is to point people to Jesus Christ, to make him known, to give him the glory. It's Jesus that we proclaim. Now, it might feel that today God's word has very little power. We seem 
see very little fruit, it feels, at least in, in our own circumstance here. The harvest seems thin. But I want you to be encouraged. There are reasons for us to be thankful as God's people, isn't there? God's word remains active and powerful. And I think the Lord has brought us an example recently. The very fact that we have Iranians in the church professing faith who've heard the gospel in a land where the gospel isn't freely available, where Bibles aren't easy to access, and the church has grown there significantly in a hard place. The word of God is powerful, and that should encourage us that God is at work. We, we need a, a world mindset, don't we, to see where, where God is at work around the world. His ways are mysterious, aren't they? Why there's blessing in one place and quietness in another at certain times. But nonetheless, God is at work. His word is powerful. People are coming to faith. God's word continues to bear fruit. Let's be thankful for what we see and hear. Thankful for Christ our King. Thankful for God's people. Thankful for God's powerful word. We can be thankful, can't we, that we have the word of God so freely before us. We still have many freedoms as God's people to, to hear it, to gather, to proclaim it. Despite the challenges or anxieties we face as God's people here today in the UK. So let's put this into practice now. We've got maybe five, ten minutes where we can pray in response to the word of God. We've been encouraged to be thankful. That's Paul's example to us. So let's have a few of us lead us in prayers of thanksgiving. Um, things we can give thanks for in the word. There might be particular people you want to give thanks for before the Lord. We can praise the Lord for who he is. So let's do that now. Let's turn to prayer and have a time of open prayer in response to the word of God as we meditate on it and respond to it. I'll close us and then we'll sing. But let's turn to the Lord in prayer first. Thank you. 
Amen. Father, we thank you for that point in our experience when we came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we reflect back on that time, Father, we thank you that, yes, it was those that loved us, those that cared for us, those that were interested in us, those that spent time with us, but above all, that we responded to those your way. Mm. We thank you for those that understand what it was to be forgiven of our sins. But taught us very early in our lives that we have to be uh, saved by the power of the Spirit of God. But we learned very often, very young in our lives, that we have to look forward to a time of uh, whatever you would call us to do. But above all, to live as the Lord Jesus Christ has taught us to live. And that all came because of the faithful teaching and the faithful leading and the faithful guidance of your precious word. So Father, we thank you for that time when your Holy Spirit led us to a conviction of our sin, led us to a conviction of the way in which you had sent the Lord Jesus Christ to be our Savior. And above all, when that Spirit taught us and led us and guided us, we were able to give our lives and our hearts and ourselves to Christ. And we thank you again because it was through your word and your word alone in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we love because you first loved us. We recognize, Lord, that uh, salvation is of you, that all that we have is of your hand. Lord, we do pray you would grow us, that you would grow our gratitude for the gospel, for one another, and for your word. Father God, we pray your forgiveness where we have been prone to forget or grumble. Lord, we ask that we would see ever more clearly all that you've done for us in the past, but also the present and the future. We thank you for that hope that is ours of heaven. May that stir and help us through the challenges and circumstances of our lives now. May your word strengthen us and grow us we pray this day as well, indeed, it would have borne fruit in the lives of others, in bringing others to new life in Christ, in this church, but also others. We ask that your word, indeed, would be faithfully proclaimed in many places, in churches of this town and towns and cities across this nation. Lord, we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and close.